question, I'm going to reflect and we're going to reflect together on architecture in an urbanizing world, thinking about many of the challenges of architecture today, looking at the Muslim world as mm -hmm. an example. Although I don't think these challenges are limited to the Muslim world, um, I think that they're true of um, the world at large. But we're looking at responses in societies where well, Muslim communities are, have a significant presence. Um, and what we're actually going to be looking at are examples which I thought provided thought-provoking opportunity to think about how do we deal with limited space? How can we be resourceful with materials? How do we create spaces of interaction? And how do we incorporate the past into the present? Um, and I think that these are key issues to be thought about um, when looking at urban environments. Okay, so I thought in order to make it interesting for us to con compare and contrast, that I would show you examples of the same type of building in different societies um, in the Muslim world where people have come up with innovative responses to um, the use of space for the same purpose. And I decided to focus on libraries because there are several innovative libraries, um, library buildings, which have been nominated and sometimes won the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, which underpins the kinds of projects we're looking at. Um, and I think that when you think about the buildings that we look at every day and we interact with every day, um, it's really refreshing to see innovative examples to common problems. So the first example we're going to look at is a micro library in Indonesia. And as its name suggests, it's a very small space, um, which I think one of the things that architects around the world are constantly grappling with is how do we provide people with spaces to do what they need to do in environments where space is very limited, where land is very expensive, where building materials are expensive. And so I'm going to, in this presentation of libraries, play a free, two or three minute film about each one. And then it will give us the opportunity to actually hear from the people using the building and the people who built it, uh, what it's like. So this is the first one. So this is a very diverse neighborhood. On one side we have middle class housing, on the other side we have a kampung, which means literally village where uh, less affluent people are living. The library is catering for the whole neighborhood for and, and mostly kids and, and young people. This design strategy, or what we did, is we took the square, we took the place as it is. So everything we kept, because we didn't want to take the reason why people are meeting here and gathering here, we didn't want to take it away. People start getting curious, enter the library and, and grab a book and start to read, where it is not about a negative feeling, but you know, in a very pleasant environment, in a, in a, in a nice public space setting. I come to the micro library two or three times a week. It is better for me to spend my spare time. I feel comfortable to be here because the environment is so cozy. There are so many books that I can read. As well as the reading activities upstairs, there is actually a nearby school using it once a week as an extension of their curriculum because the neighborhood school does not have their own library. The space underneath the microlibrary Bima is often used for informal gathering, so kids would just uh, use the football field there and would rest there, get shaded from the rain, also for the Wi-Fi actually. The four walls, all the sides of the microlibrary are made from ice cream buckets. So people sell them online for very cheap, under one US dollar. The thickness of the bucket itself is one millimeter so you can easily drill into it and, and, and mount it. The buckets are open, the buckets are closed. With that, 
We have cross ventilation because the whole space doesn't have any air conditioning. They're translucent. That means part of the daylight and the sunlight is reflected, part of it is transmitted without the building overheats in the interior. This bucket facade has several layers of functionality, climate design, all the physical aspects. It relates a little bit to the garbage issue, uh, plastic waste, uh, reuse, consciousness about natural resources. Uh, in some evenings, like not so late, between 7 and 8 p.m., when the light is on, it looks like a nice lantern in the evening and it just lights the neighborhood. So one of the key things that innovative architecture and architectural solutions do is think about how to solve common problems in sometimes very radical ways. So in this case, um, as you saw, it's a piece of land where those people, community members gathered. The architects didn't want to disrupt that gathering function, but also wanted to augment the, the functions of the community space by adding a library. And obviously had a very limited budget and thought, well, what can we use that is readily available, cheap, and can create a space that filters the light, creates ventilation in an appropriate way. And... I mean, in thinking about architecture and thinking about this session, one of the key considerations is what is the legal framework? What is the governmental framework? What is the, what is the state providing you with the opportunity to do or not to do? And I think that among the great restrictions um, of architects and architecture or planning restrictions that in, ma in many most countries, in most environments, you wouldn't be able to build a library using ice cream boxes. But you realize when given the freedom to design in innovative ways and use materials that might not be conventionally used for building, actually, architects are able to come up with um, a wonderful array of solutions. Um, so I'm going to go on to the next example, which is a, an equally small library, but this time in Beijing in China, um, in the historic quarter of the city, which happens to be a Muslim quarter. And one of the things, I mean, China is not at all unique in that often poorer areas of inner cities are seen to be uh, eyesores, they seem to be unattractive, and governments spend a lot of money um, trying to replace them and, and wipe them away. And um, what, what I think committed designers and committed urban preservationists, one of the things that they have in common around the world is that they try to show you, show you that actually a poor, poorish urban area, which is, has high density, is not necessarily a bad place to live. It's not necessarily beyond hope. And actually, you can intervene. I mean, generally, planning officials always say, oh, these poor people, they don't have facilities, they don't have services. Um, and so, Examples like the one I'm going to show you are a good example of how actually you can intervene in a dense urban environment and improve the quality of life without, without spending millions and millions of dollars rebuilding everything and wiping away identity and community structure um, in the process. Because one of the things to think about with urban environments is that they're not, they're not just buildings, they're also the spaces where people interact and when you think about what makes a place livable, it's as much about the sense of neighborhood, the sense of who do we know, how, how safe do we feel here, how much is it a home, as it is about what our window looks like or uh, what the shape of the roof is. So um, I'll play the second video, which provides an equally interesting example, which I think responds beautifully to the idea of urban density, the lack of space, and um, the fact that you don't have to have widespread dem demolition and rebuilding. And one of the things I found actually is that in thinking about what makes architectural projects remarkable is the ability to get beyond the layers of bureaucracy and do something unusual, which requires great persistence and skill. A 
I always think that uh, the children's life under the tree in the old neighborhoods, it can create interesting memories. In Beijing, the tendency is to construct new buildings instead of restoring old neighborhoods. The architect Zhang Kei has gone against the flow of this trend. Families, they lived here for hundreds of years. They're all local. And then in the past five years, the government's spending uh, time and, and, and funding to relocate them to, to 100 kilometers away into towers. And then our idea is possible by redesign, reuse, repair and renovate uh, these uh, structures. The government proposed to Zhang Kei to put his ideas into practice in the Dashila neighborhood near Tiananmen Square. They give us this courtyard to, uh, to see maybe you can propose uh, what this could be uh, renewed, uh, uh, renovated uh, for the community. We got some recycled uh, bricks to, to build the little structures, uh, the little art uh, space and the little uh, service kitchen. And uh, we think that it will be, will be uh, good for the community that we introduce a children's library. Here comes the, the library. And uh, of course this part uh, is uh, the children's library part. And this is uh, the multifunction space. So they can show movies. And uh, this is the room. Mr. Wan is the paper cut artist and, and he teaches uh, children paper cut. It's fine. It's pretty good. This spot used to be full of rubbish. Now look at it. Children are coming here to play. Large-scale development is really uh, threatening the old part of the city. And I think to have something small-scale, to do it more subtly for the old city uh, renewal is an interesting uh, thing for the municipality. So in this example, one of the key things is that these sorts of interventions generally are led by thoughtful groups of people who have spent a lot of time understanding the area in which they work. And I would say that the, one of the challenges of state entities dealing with the urban realm is that they don't have time and they need, they, there's a lot of pressure on them to achieve wide scale change quickly. And thoughtful and sensitive interventions tend not to be quick. This, as you saw, is very small scale. But in, in this case, I mean, the municipality allowed the architects to come up with a proposal for this children's library and art center within a courtyard space um, in, the, in the inner city, um, which meant that there was at least government buy-in of the opportunity that people should have the opportunity to try. But one of the things that, as I said, prevents this sort of intervention um, happening frequently is that governments think, oh, well, we, need to we don't have time to, for, to spend six months doing a five- a 50 meter library in one courtyard, we have to show that we're bringing about widespread benefits to a huge community. Um, let's just demolish everything and, re and start again. And it's about priorities. It's also about to what extent do people have a voice in determining their urban environment. And often, unfortunately, people don't have a voice. Um, they may express what they think, but it's not often the case that they are listened to. And you, might, you may wonder why in a course on modern and contemporary architecture of the Muslim world, we're looking at interventions in historic environment. I think that the reality is that most of the time, environments already exist and interventions happen in existing fabrics. And so it isn't just about we have a flat, empty piece of land and we build what we want. It's usually that we're um, intervening in an existing context. And my aim today is to show you different forms of intervention um, that, have, that embrace modern design and functionality 
of, of people as they need as they require to live today, but also show regard for what exists, not just in terms of physical environment, also social relationships. Um, I'm now going to show you our third example of a library, which I think also demonstrates an important uh, urban intervention. And this is in uh, Suta. In, uh, it's part, technically part of Spain, but it's actually in North Africa. And there's a very small part of Spain um, on the North African coast, very close, to, right next to Morocco. Um, and in this case, um, the, the municipality was going to build housing on the site um, in the city center, and they started digging the foundations and they found a very important archaeological site from the 14th, 15th centuries, uh, the Maradid dynasty, which was a Muslim dynasty uh, living at the time. And the city archaeologists managed to convince the municipal authorities that the site was too important um, to just, I mean, that they couldn't demolish the site. And they thought, well, what can we do? We, of course, want to respect history, but we also want to use the site, given that it's a central location. And they came up with the idea of a public library, which they thought would be a good use of the site uh, for the local community, but also they found an interesting way of preserving it. Ceuta mm, holds such a different kinds of buildings and situations, so we thought that um, the building must be very neutral, very simple and very easy. Ceuta, a small Spanish enclave on Moroccan soil. In a space provided for the construction of a public library, there was once an archaeological site dating back to the Marinid dynasty, which ruled Morocco between the 13th and 15th centuries. Architect Angela Garcia took an important decision. Most of the space was uh, occupied by the archaeological um, excavation, but we thought that uh, the sense of the excavation was very important for the city of Ceuta because it was part of their culture, of their history, and it could be a good goal for the project to keep it um, seen for all the people that entered the library. Besides the uh, archaeological area, that's this um, large reading room where, where all the books are displayed and all the reading places are, are displayed. Also, the views are beautiful. Basically, uh, the uh, building materials we have here in the library are concrete for all the basement and um, aluminium facade and glass for the rest of the building. Here, here we can notice why the uh, aluminium panels, they are not horizontal. They are um, parallel to, to the street. So here we have two different geometries, no? the horizontal one and the one that runs parallel to the streets. The library has become an essential element in the cultural activities of the city. It not only meets the traditional purpose of a library, but is also a center that has a clear objective, primarily of social significance in harmony with the social activity of the city. In the two years it's been open, it has already welcomed more than 300,000 visitors. For me, it's very touching to see it full of people. This is the most important part of architecture, no? that architecture is only the reason for uh, making better the life of people. I mean, what they did actually was a very clever solution. They retained the archaeological site and they built the library around it with the archaeological site in the center of the building. And it gave them the opportunity to display the finds um, of the site um, on public display and also to create a public program of engagement around the history of the site and the history of Suta. And one of the things to think about with the specific context of Spain is that the Muslim period of Spanish history is often um, not paid great attention to. It's seen as, I mean, not, 
I mean, now, I mean, it's, there's, there's attention towards this period of Spanish history, and it's often overlooked. And so, one of the great things about this library in Suta, which has a very high, a very interesting mix of Spanish, of Spaniards of Spanish descent, and also Moroccans, given that it's on, in North Africa, is that it's a meeting place for young people who come to study, to work. It's very attractive. It's on the sea, um, and it highlights the trajectory of Spanish history and Spanish identity. And it's become one of the key meeting places in the city, which is um, based on its amazing location as well. Actually, it was interesting because I went to visit this project and I interviewed and chatted with many people using the library about what they liked about it. And one of the things um, they mentioned was that it was conducive to, to there were spaces to work on your own, but there were also spaces to, to work as a group, that it had this amazing light, it had the amazing view of the sea, it has a lovely rooftop terrace where you can go and have a break, and also uh, the light in Zuta is very strong, and these slats that you see are actually filters to make sure that you have bright light, but that it isn't blinding and that you can sit on a computer without having too much of a glare. And so for projects like this, for projects like this beg the question, who is actually responsible for thoughtful design in an urban environment? And often, I think this library is actually a very good example. Often the answer is that it isn't one entity or one person, but the combination of many people. So in this case, um, it was the initially it was the archaeologists who realized that the site was very important, who managed to lobby effectively for its preservation rather than its destruction, and the municipal authorities considered the request and decided that they would do something different from what they had originally planned. And I would say that that is not a very common occurrence. That often with municipal authorities they have a plan and. Whatever happens, they want to implement it. And often history is seen as not, a, not, a great not of great significance when you want to build something um, new. One of the things to think about, which I think is true of many, many contexts, is that there's political pressure to be seen to ser serve your constituency or your community, often through the building of housing. Um, and I mean, the building of housing is often a political act. Um, in this case, the municipal authorities of Suta were enlightened enough to see that they wouldn't be able to build housing on the site given its, its archaeological status. But a public building with the space that I showed you um, would work well. And so they decided that they could serve their, their community in, in a different way, which is what they did. They also instituted a very rich program of cultural events. Um, and I mean, to design a great building is one thing, but to make sure that it functions in serving its community is another thing. And they also had the vision to hire a very dynamic director um, who made the library more than a library and more of a cultural center. And I would say that the, the, the three examples that I've just showed you all um, combine this aspect of how can we build a building that responds to an environment in an unusual and an enlightened way, and also enables the community to express itself, to meet, to be creative. So here's an example. Here's a shot of the inside of the library with a space where they have concerts and recitals. And you can also see um, children looking at the archaeological site. In this case, they're just looking at it. But often, as I told you, the, they have activities, especially during school holidays, to, to animate the space. And this is a fourth library that I wanted to show you in Cairo, actually, the Barakat Trust, of which I'm director, um, funded or contributed funding of this space, which um, is a, a space in a converted 17th century house, which was due for demolition. It was in bad condition, and the municipalities, authorities thought that there's no hope, we should just destroy it. Um, and an Egyptian couple bought the building faced loads of court cases against the municipality who, who wanted to 
find the millions of Egyptian pounds for trying to save a building that they thought should be destroyed. And the the owner of the or one of the owners of the house, Dr. Ala Al Habashi, is also a book, a book collector, an architect, a professor of architecture and architectural conservation, and decided that he wanted to use that that he felt the more he could integrate public activity in this old house, the more he could raise awareness about how you can intervene in a contemporary way in, in old buildings and old areas. And so the, sl the slide on the left shows you the courtyard of the house. Um, the room at the far right behind the tree is actually the library, which you can see on the right. And one of the things that he did very beautifully was retain old aspects of the space, like the ceiling, but also in create a modern intervention, the, like the mezzanine, the bookshelves, the furniture, and in an era of scarce resources and huge urban pressures of population growth, most many people living in cities, um, a lack of space, you realize that these sorts of interventions are key. Um, they, they, they create a very important link between existing urban fabric and buildings and contemporary interventions. They breathe new life into spaces that are often disused or abandoned. Whereas you saw in the example in China, the lady said, oh, this place used to be full of rubbish. And now their children are playing and they're doing paper cutting and it becomes a creative space. So um, one of the things that the Aga Khan Award for Architecture does, and Farah spoke about it a bit in the first section, is it tries to highlight how you can actually intervene in an inspired way and make a difference, um, hopefully that other people can, can follow. That, that ultimately it's through, I mean, if you look at how the, the world evolves, it usually evolves through someone having a bright idea and, and sharing it and other one, others thinking, oh, this is great, we want to do it too. So these four examples from, different, from Indonesia, China, Spain, and Egypt, I hope in, in focusing on the same type of building, um, show you that there are different ways of intervening to think about modern architecture, modern design, community, and the urban context. I'm just mindful of time. Okay, I'll talk for 10 more minutes and then we can open the discussion. Okay, the other thing, of course, I want to talk about is shelter. That most architects and most architectural questions are about living spaces. And the thing, about, the thing to think about is, what is the basic need? And the basic need, I would say, is a roof over one's head, um, probably water, a space that is not too cold and not too hot, um, and protects you from uh, the elements. And I, I decided to start with this um, emergency housing response in Iran, which is made of sandbags, because I think it, it encapsulates very well um, what any intervention re related to housing and shelter requires. It provide, any, any, any house will provide these elements. Obviously, if you go to Buckingham Palace or the White House, it will provide you with a lot else. But the basic needs of architecture in a, res in a residential context for people is to provide them a comfortable space where um, they're protected and can live their lives in some kind of safety, protected from the seasons, from wild animals to, from theft. Um, and so let's take this as a point of departure. Um, and I, in the reading list, I put the short film about the sandbag shelter. Um, so I'm not going to play it now, given that I, I was delayed, but uh, we move on to something else. Oops, sorry. And this is just to show you um, that even in the most basic of designs, which in this case is just bags of sand piled by an, arch an Iranian architect, obviously, who had design skills, but he created domed spaces uh, for temporary, um, temporary residences of people who had suffered from a massive earthquake in Iran. But he also thought about things, how do I control light? How do I, I make sure that it's not too hot? How do I ensure ventilation? So if you look at the image above, there are vents close to the ceiling to allow um, air to escape. There's also a wind scoop. And so there's really no excuse for bad architecture. 
There's no excuse for architecture that doesn't respond to the climate. And um, even with the most basic and cheapest materials and the direst circumstances, with the right approach, um, you can design something functional and responsive to people's needs. And I'm going to focus on a very important example, um, the preservation of the Medina and Tunis in Tunisia and the modern city adjacent to it. In 1967, um, there were plans to completely redevelop the, the poorer part of the Medina of Tunis. And that's something you find in many places in the world that affluent areas tend to be preserved. Poorer areas are usually seen as as being unattractive and unappealing. And because they don't have monumental buildings, people just think, oh, um, they, these areas are poor, let's just wipe them away. We should have straight streets and people don't like this traditional way of living. We should have apartment buildings that all look the same. Um, the, in Tunis, in the 1960s, they are about to pro adopt the same approach to an area called Hafseya, which was the poor area or a poor area of the historic city. And um, they faced protests by people that didn't want to be relocated and didn't want to move. And remarkably, the government decided that rather than carry out its plan, it would think about the urban environment as a valuable asset and think about how it would improve it, how it could intervene through contemporary interventions, but respect the city as it was. And one of the things that they did, which I think is key, is they looked at the economy of the city. Um, when we look at architecture, we sometimes forget the economic dimension of things. It underpins everything we do, everything we build, everything we plan, and the survival of every building. And one of the, one of the, one of the things that the, the government was keen to do was not to fall into the trap of what we call gentrification, of improving an area, but leading to the displacement of the original occupants and their replacement with people who are more affluent, which often, often happens with this sort of scheme. In this case, they thought, well, um, our aim is also to retain and improve the quality of lives of the people of limited, limited income living in small apartments um, rather than just um, refurbishing the place and making it for wealthy, wealthy residents or kind of foreigners or tourists. And what they did is they built new apartment buildings but well, they built new buildings within the urban fabric of this old bit of the city. But they also thought of a tax structure that would mean that those who purchased larger properties would subsidize those living in the smaller properties of um, the ones with limited income. And they also designed properties of 40 square meters, two bedroom properties. I mean, 40 square meters is a very small space, but it's adequate for a two room two rooms, a bathroom, a kitchen area, and a living area. Um, and they made sure that, that these spaces would not cost more than 18% of the monthly income of the residents. And, and apart from, I mean, this project won the Aga Khan Award um, in the late 70s, not because its architecture as such was magnificent, but because it had approached architecture and it had approached urbanism in a deep and meaningful way and it had thought about economic dimensions. It didn't just create spaces that um, drawn on a drawing board with no um, appreciation of the economic purchasing power of local residents. It thought about creating also or ensuring that this neighborhood remained mixed income and mixed use and that it wouldn't be it just it wouldn't be a slum and it wouldn't be a place that excluded those of limited income. And traditionally, Historic urban environments like the Medina of Tunis had wealthy areas and poor areas, and the municipality was keen that it wouldn't rupture this, this healthy mix of people living there. And I mean, I would say that the Association of the Preservation of the Medina of Tunis, ASM, which has now also expanded to work on the modern city built in the 20th century, is exemplary in that um, it's it's very strongly linked to the municipality, and yet it's independent. Um, um, the may mayors of the city have had a very important role in its, in, its, in its management, but it also has the ability to highlight and, and to preserve and to protect and to safeguard. And it does this through a combination of ways. One is raising awareness. Secondly, through effective urban monitoring, because there'll always be people that 
want to get away with things and think of their own interests. And we have to monitor to see what's going on, what is declining, what is deteriorating, what needs intervention. It also had the wisdom to see that the modern, the more modern architecture of Tunis was important. And it isn't all about old houses and archways and tiles. Um, it was dynamic enough to be integrated into the national system, but also encourage international cooperation. And fifthly, which is the point I started off with, it was fully aware of the social and economic aspects of any project like that. And I would say that planning schemes and architects and urban designers and urban planners don't always fully invest in understanding the economic dynamics of a place and often what makes um, uh, and also the social dynamics what makes urban interventions fail is not that the bathroom leaks or the roof leaks it's often that they haven't been conceived to respond effectively to the specific context of the people that live there their needs their aspirations their social norms how they socialize and I've seen this time and time again where governments build new apartment buildings um, which they think are better for the residents because they're clean and they all look the same. And actually, they don't account for the fact that residents keep chickens or they need a place to hang their laundry out because they don't have a dryer or that, they, that social spaces for interaction are really important as well. But I strongly recommend for anyone who's interested, um, I'll share these later, but read on the Association um, the, the, the Preservation de Tunis and um, I think it's an exemplary case that has evolved and learned over the past 50 years or so, 60 years actually and here are some other images um, of the urban interventions the new buildings that were created as infill into places where there were vacant plots of land so, as I said, I mean, people that reviewed this project noted that it was perhaps more significant socially and economically than you need to go and look at buildings, but it is a very important project. Um, and I'm going to end with something at the other end of the scale, which is the Petronas Towers in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Um, which are the, some which were the tallest buildings in the world. I'm not sure if they still are, but one of the things to think about in uh, in think about urban environment was mega cities, skyscrapers, tall buildings, and many of the examples that I've showed you are smaller interventions, smaller scale. But how how can we design buildings? Um, at a large scale, at a high scale, that have a, 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 more than 100 floors um, in a way that responds to a specific context. And you often find, like in this case, that gifted architects, this is Pelli, a very famous architect, think about how can we take traditional responses to the climate, for example, shutters, uh, louvers that allow air in, um, and adapt them to a very contemporary um, and very different scale, like these massive Petronas Towers. And the other thing about the Petronas Towers is that <laughs> in terms of the form, um, they draw upon the geometry of traditional Malay architecture, of, um, of architecture from the broader Islamic world. For the last few decades, Kuala Lumpur has seen tremendous change. Although many traditional buildings remain, recent economic growth has seen a proliferation of high-rise offices in a multitude of imported styles. In 1981, the decision to redevelop a central location presented the opportunity to give the skyline a distinctly Malaysian feel. At 432 meters, the Petronas Towers are the tallest buildings in the world. But their value as an architectural statement goes beyond their height. This is where the colors and patterns of traditional Malaysia merge with a groundbreaking exercise in engineering technology, 
to create an architectural wonder of the world. Designed by the architect Cesar Pelli, they're now the internationally recognized symbol of modern Malaysia. It was very important to me to design buildings that, first of all, would not look like buildings in the United States or Europe or Japan, but that they would look instead sufficiently unique that people could see them as Malaysian. Built on the site of a race course, the complex offers almost half a million square meters of floor space that includes offices, conference centers, and malls. The towers are based upon a modern interpretation of a traditional Islamic design that uses two interlocking squares. Here, eight semicircles in the angles of the corners were added to create more floor space. As they climb upwards, the towers taper inward at six points, creating the illusion of their slender form. At the top, steel pinnacles give the towers their record-breaking height. 170 meters from the ground, a sky bridge joins the two buildings together. The exterior is clad in horizontal ribbons of glass and stainless steel panels. Integrated sunshades counter the glare of the sun, yet still allow an appreciation of the spectacular view outside. They add considerable three-dimensionality to the facade, which together with the star shape creates continuously changing light related to the dappled light under the canopies of the rainforest. At the heart of the towers are central concrete cores that carry space-saving double-decker elevators as well as pipes and cabling. Sixteen columns on the periphery constitute the main structural system. At night, the towers glow in the darkness, adding a majestic presence to the skyline. The Patronus Towers embrace Malaysia's heritage while proclaiming its modernization. They affirm the country's position on the world stage, an icon that will forever be identified with Kuala Lumpur. So, what I hope to show you in this presentation is that actually, thinking about the urban environment, thinking about cities today, there's a wide range of interventions um, that are important. Most of what I've showed you are buildings, but um, sorry. one thing to think about is that public spaces are also essential. That it isn't just about providing someone with a roof over their head, but it's also how does a community interact, where are the spaces where it meets each other, where are the spaces where social barriers are broken down. And this is an example in Copenhagen. Um, in an area with a, a very high um, percentage of Muslim migrants, where a couple of Danish architects um, decided that they would create a public park that, oops, sorry, a public park that would enable uh, residents to come together to interact and for children of different backgrounds to play with each other. And the way they designed the park is that they incorporated elements from different cultures. So, for example, there's a high concentration of Moroccans or people of Moroccan origin. They have a fountain that's based on a Moroccan design with tile work. Um, and it's a way of creating spaces that are identifiable, also identifiable with a community and a culture, and then encouraging diverse people to meet in those spaces where, I know, people might be having a beer and other people might be praying. Um, and one of the things that, that studies of public space have found is that actually public spaces that are inclusive are the best places where people of different economic group backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds can meet each other. Um, and children are always a good place to start because in general, children have fewer prejudices than anyone else. And if you, from an early age, they get used to playing in a beautiful playground with children of different backgrounds. They grow up more tolerant, more accepting. And of course, one key thing is that it's also a great opportunity for families to get to know each other through their children. Um, so Super Keelan 
which is actually I'll I'll show you. I'll try and find the film quickly. Um, yeah. If I can find it in two minutes, I'll share it because I think it's a nice way to close. This area is one of the areas in, in Copenhagen with the highest crime rate, or maybe even in entire Denmark. It felt very unsecure. To make the Nerebro neighborhood safer, the City Hall of Copenhagen decided to create a big public park. Architect Nana Gilto Muller and artist Rasmus Nielsen were in charge of the project. In our very first walk through the area, we could see that there was a big diversity in the people living in the neighborhood. We, we found that it was around 60 different nations living in the area. And rather than seeing the diversity as a problem, we wanted to see it as a resource. So basically that in the park there would be elements from as many countries of the people living here uh, through objects and stories. The golden one is a playground from India. and. Uh, the elephant slide is from Chernobyl. And um, the red benches over there are kind of a double bench from Switzerland. And also one of our favorites is the, the Moroccan fountain, where parents often sit and meet and talk while the kids are playing. The idea of the park was to make use of dreams that could kind of materialize into things. We divided the area in like three parts. Yeah, all three areas. They are very different. The red square is uh, mainly for skaters. There's the black square is more classical square, where the locals are hanging out and kids are playing. And then the green park is more uh, for exercise and uh, more bigger sports activities. It's pretty easy to see today that all these different activities, they make people meet. For me, that's one of the, the greatest things, to see that people actually meet in the area. We wanted to create a public space where people from a very diverse sort of backgrounds would sort of feel at home. Our motto, yes, is more. It's, uh, it's very much about not saying no to things, saying yes. Okay, so I hope that in this uh, pre presentation of thinking about urban interventions, both of buildings and of spaces, it's highlighted some of the key issues of um, the urban context today, the issues that any planner needs to think about. And some gifted planners and gifted municipal or enlightened municipalities and fruitful architects do manage to come up with great solutions that a hundred other people wouldn't have thought about. And so... In this course, actually, what we're trying to do is to highlight the thoughtful, the remarkable, the exemplary. Um, and I'd be very happy to hear your questions or thoughts on uh, what you've heard and seen. Okay, so there's a question with a comment saying that it was an uplifting presentation. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to hear it, given that the, there were lots of technical issues that delayed me. I had to find the cafe. A crow flew into the cafe, into the cafe when I was talking, which is also very distracting. So I'm happy that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't bad. Um, the question is about the library in Cairo. Is it open to the public? Yes, it is open to the public, and we wouldn't have funded it actually had it not been a public library. Um, when ha it's open certain days a week, and I, th I think one has to um, notify them that you're coming, but it's open. It's a very beautiful space. Um, and it's an excellent example of how private initiative can achieve what state initiatives often do not, because the state is very good, as I said, at doing big mega projects. It's less good at seeing a jewel of a space and thinking, oh, this is wonderful, I'm going to do something about it. And so um, I think that it's the complementarity of large state projects and clever, thoughtful private initiatives 
that change the urban environment. And, and I would say um, that it's important to recognize the role of the private sector, of NGOs, of the architectural profession in changing perceptions. Um, and the person asked about, is there a residence on the site? Yes, the library is called, or the house is called Beit Yakan, and it does have accommodation on site. There's another question actually about awareness campaigns related to repurposing thoughtful architects and enlightened bureaucrats. What else should modern architects be thinking about when approaching urban projects? I would think, I would say longevity. And the other thing to think about is change, that societies change, societies and, and people change um, as, they, as they pass through life. And flexibility is something that's quite important in design, that if something is too rigid, um, it often does not survive the test of time well. There's a great book, How Buildings Learn by Stuart Brand, which talks about buildings that, innate, that survived across time and changed and um, responded to different generations of the same family or different uses in terms of institutional buildings and others that were magnificent buildings that um, were too rigid in their design and did not function or did not think about uses. And one of the things that the Aga Khan Wood does, and we'll talk about it more in the last session, is it's very rigorous in assessing projects to see whether they actually work or not. But it never gives a prize to a project that looks good but doesn't function. And so the library in Spain, which I showed you, which I had to go and review, I already mentioned that one of the things I did was go and talk to teenagers using the library what do you like about it? How important is the archaeological site? Why did you come here? And, um, and thinking about, does it really work? Or is it the product of an architect's dream that falls flat in implementation? And implementation is also, how does a building survive the test of time? Where does it function well? Do you find that the architects and the designers have thought or a space? Have they thought about uh, where will families sit? Where, where is there a place, for example, in the park for uh, toddlers, um, etc.? Okay, there's, um, there's another question or ref reflection about public engagement, saying that a great example is Nina Gottma's architectural space um, for the 2023 Serpentine Pavilion, who used bio-source bio materials um, and encourages people to come together around the tab. Yeah, I mean, it is a great example and thoughtful and careful and um, parsimonious, use, parsimonious use of materials so that it's not wasteful um, is key. Also creating spaces for interaction. And I think the thing about public space is that it's both a space for interaction and a space for private reflection. And I, I know of a study in London, for example, of central London parks, including Russell Square, where they, someone did this project of putting diaries in key parts of the park and seeing what people wrote in them. And they realized that spaces are as much a space for delving into yourself as they are meeting others. And often the best interventions, whether they're 40, room, 40 square meter apartment buildings, a library, um, a park, a, sky, a skyscraper, incorporate these different facets of our personality and of our mood. Uh, thank you for your comment about the choice of examples. The question is, which have I visited and how important is consulting people? I think consulting people is very important, but it's, it's important to... Consult, them in a, consult people in a way to find out what they need and how they live and what they like and what they dislike about their current status quo. You might not wish to consult people about whether to use ice cream boxes or not, or which, um, which shutter to have for a library or I mean, what the lighting, lighting system should be like. I think it's about understanding use patterns um, and architects and urban designers are also technicians. They have the technical knowledge, but it's about how do you apply, how do you develop a deep understanding and that enables you to apply technical knowledge in a way that um, 
creates the spaces that make people comfortable and make them happy. There's a saying attributed to Henry Ford, but I don't think it's true, saying that if he asked people what they would have wanted, they would have never thought of a car, they would have said, we want a faster horse. So perhaps no one ever would have said, make us a library out of ice cream boxes, but they would say, we want good light and we want good air. And um, I, to, to answer the specific question, I visited the library in Egypt and the one in Spain. I visited the Patronus Towers as well. Uh, there's a question about the repurposing of plastic buckets in the micro library project. Uh, there's a very good project, which I put in the reading materials in Sudan. It's a, car, it's a hospital, the Salam Cardiac Center. And it, they used containers, you know, shipping containers, and created a whole, a whole wing of the a whole building, basically, out of ship, real shipping containers. There was another project, which I think in Lebanon, a refugee camp that also used containers. So you do find that often with very, very simple materials, you can create great architecture. Um, but you need freedom to do it because I would say that for the most part, if many people are very conventional, state systems tend to be conventional. And if you propose something very unconventional, they tell you it can't be done. But think about the sandbag shelter that I showed you. There have been numerous great architects in the modern period that have thought about cheap, environmentally available materials and produced the best buildings. But you have to have the confidence, I believe, and the space to be able to implement those visions and to not let many people, not let too many people dissuade you. Um, there's a good quote. I mean, Churchill was not always polite, but he did say, that if you want to reach your destination, you can't stop to throw stones at every dog that barks along the way. And I think with architecture and design, that's true. You sometimes, I mean, it's a very important balance between listening to people, but also having listened, taking the path that you think is going to bring, what, bring them what they want. But also, I suppose, the opportunity to reflect and to stand back and to change and to adapt and to realize that change is part of any design process. Next session, we'll be looking at thinking about the environment and architecture, um, a really important topic. Um, and so I look forward to seeing you, or for, to you seeing me, I suppose, and to your questions next time. And thanks again.